when I uh, first started preaching, one of the things, the feedback was, when you're setting up and getting yourself ready, you tend to say something stupid. So I'm really chuffed with myself that I managed to say absolutely nothing then uh, while I was fiddling about, so uh, that, was, that was good. Um, a really warm welcome to you. Thank you to the, to the music group um, and to Lewis and for all those that have been involved. Um, I don't know when you arrived to church. I was a bit later because uh, we've got um, people staying with us. Um, so when I arrived, there was a lovely gauntlet of welcomers. I don't normally get that when I'm the second person um, here. So that was great. It was lovely to see so many people welcoming. Thank you for the people that were on welcoming this morning. It's a really uh, warm welcome um, as we arrived. I might, in future, set up and then slip out the side door and come round again uh, just to receive that because it was, it was really nice uh, to do. Tribe, you should have a, a sheet that I've uh, produced. I noticed that Jonah's already finished his word search. Um, that's probably because he wanted to listen intently uh, to this bit, but if you want to have those sheets in front of you, haven't got one, Signal and Ian will get you one, and we'll have it together as we work through. So we're thinking about Christ's triumph from um, progression and spreading the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. And hopefully that doesn't make a great deal of sense to you, because um, if it does, then I might be wasting my next sort of 30 minutes of time. Because uh, that's what we're going to unpack. What on earth the verses we've, we've talked about mean? For those of you that have not heard me speak before, my tendency is to, to highlight something. That's the bit on screen um, that I'm going to be talking about, that I'm going to be referring to. It's great to have your Bibles open in front of you so you know what we're doing as we go through. Uh, it's also, um, some of the other verses will be on the screen. You can flick to those if you want, but you could also note those down and have a look at them when you get home. So this passage that Lewis just read to us, and as he said, it's in a series that we've, we've been doing. This is the fourth um, week that we've been looking at this, though one of them was a while back. It, it seems a little bit, I don't know, when I first got it I thought, oh, oh, yeah, excellent, really good. Um, and it, it doesn't jump out to me like some of the other passages, but actually as I've, as I've explored it, as I've unpacked it, I've been really blessed by it. So basically we've got this guy, um, Paul. Now, Paul is, is, is going around preaching and when he comes to a certain place, he says there, the door was open. And what that means is, it was a really good place. It seems like lots of opportunities for him to speak. The door being open means he, he finds people that are willing to listen and there's a great opportunity there. Yet he leaves and he goes on to Macedonia. Now, previously when he's visited there, he's had some horrible experiences. And he knows for when he goes there again, it's going to be a horrible experience. So what Paul is saying, and what the people that have first read this would have got, and Phil talked about last week, didn't he? That we've got to do a lot of work to understand the context of where it is. What they would have heard there was, he left somewhere really, really open to the gospel and went to that place that had been really harsh to him and is going to be harsh to him again. Well, why... Why is it? Because he seems that he wants to meet up with Titus. Hang on, that's nice. But why is Paul writing that to the Corinthians? What on earth has that got to do? Well, let's do a little bit of um, background. Let's do a little bit of thinking. Um, so Paul um, was one of the, the founders of the church in Corinth. And, and he has this vision given to him in Acts 18 verse 9, where it's, it's hard and there's persecution coming and, and the Jews are sort of organising themselves against him. God speaks to him and says... You know, don't worry. I have many people in this city stay there. And Paul stayed there for a year and a half. So he's been at this church for 18 months. He knows the church. He loves the people of the church. He's worked with the church for a long period of time. He doesn't stay there forever. He moves on. And after a time in Antioch, um, he spends a the time there. He's, he's travelled to Antioch. And now he's travelling back and he's visiting the churches that he's planted, that he's set up. And he, he longs to go back to, to, to the Corinthian church in Corinth and, and see what's happened. But as he's been travelling at that time away, he's got reports that not everything is good in Corinth. And he, and he communicates with the church. We have one of those communications with us in the book of 1 Corinthians. And roughly it divides up, like the first four chapters, he talks about the divisions there are in the church following different teachings, following different things. And then he talks about the, the attitudes of getting um, sex wrong. Then he, then he does a lot about food and how they're, they're dwelling on food regulation. Then he talks a lot about the meeting together as church gathered 
And then he talks about they haven't even got a full grasp of the resurrection. There's errors in that, that teaching that have come into that church. And this grieves Paul. Lewis looked at last week, the, he, he used that really helpful illustration. I, I hope you remembered it. If you don't, it's, it's available online. You should, you should have a, a listen to it. He, he talks about Paul being like um, parents that are out. And the babysitter, I don't think he used that word. Uh, but we still use that for our 14-year-old. Um, but the babysitter phones up and says, your kids are behaving terribly. And the parents don't rush home. They, they say, put them on the phone. And say, we're going to be home at 10. By then, you need to have sorted it out. You need to have changed. Well, that's what Paul does here. He wanted to visit the church twice. He wanted to go, as he went up one way, he wanted to visit them. And then when he came back, he wanted to visit them twice. But he says, so you have time to put right what you're not doing. I'm only going to visit you once. I'm only going to visit you on the way back. And that's not because Paul doesn't like them. That's not Paul throwing his toys out the pram. That is for their benefit. It's to spare them. Because if Paul comes and has to deal with this stuff, um, he, he'll, he'll, he'll have to do that in an authority manner. He'd much rather they did it themselves. He'd much rather they worked through it themselves. He'd much rather they understood what it was and they dealt with the issues that he had. But here's a little bit that snuck out to me what, um, as I was preparing this. I had confidence in you all. So Paul's written this letter and he's saying he has confidence in them all. You think, well, okay, but what? Okay, so Paul loves the Corinthian church, but, but what's that got to do with Titus? And what's that got to do with him going to, to Macedonia? What, what's that all about? Well, actually, Paul picks up this thread again, and we'll look at it in a few months' time um, when we get to chapter 7. Because uh, we're taking a break for Christmas. I'm not going to preach that long on this one top. Um, we're taking a break for Christmas, so we'll come back to this then. Um, but w- when we get to it, we'll, we'll see. But Paul says that he went to Macedonia and he said it was hard. Look, you can see there, conflicts from insiders, from outsiders, fear within. But Titus came. Titus came. Titus came to him and and Titus, what's interesting? Titus comes with the report of the Corinthian church. So Paul is going off this way, but Titus has gone to visit them. Titus is then going to meet up with Paul and tell them about what happens. And look at what, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I don't want to spoil whatever the person says, uh, whoever, whoever's going to get this um, section. But Titus is blessed by them. He's been refreshed by you all. And how does Paul finish that section in verse 16? I am glad I had complete confidence in you all. You see, Titus brings a report back that the Corinthian church loves Paul. And has listened to Paul's correspondence and is working through it to restore themselves to what they once were. And that knowledge fuels Paul. But in the letter, we're not there yet. We're not in chapter 7. We're back in chapter 2. So, that's the context of what Paul is writing in. And then then Paul comes on to talk about, but thanks God for always leading us. It's God that leads him. He gets a lot of stick, Paul, because his his plans change. And his plans change because he plans in pencil, but God writes in, in pen. And that's not Paul's fault. That is Paul being open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But, but he plans one thing, oh, I want to do this, and then this happens. And people use that to snipe at him. They use that to attack him. And they go, oh, that Paul. He says one thing and does another. He moves around. And Paul isn't like that. Paul is led where Christ wants him to go. And then we've got this phrase that we're going to, we're going to sing about the next section is, spreading the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. That's Paul's task. That's Paul's analogy. That's what Paul is thinking about. And what, what does this aroma do? Well, this aroma does two things. It, it saves lives, but it also brings death. It, it saves lives and it, it brings death. To, to some, it's this salvation smell, and, and for some, it's, it's this death sentence. So when we, when we think about that, I, I was thinking about, um, as I read that, about John 3.16. And everybody loves the first part, don't you? You'll see that on T-shirts, and on bumper stickers, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but interestingly, listening to the context of it, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in his commands, but this is the bit I'm interested in, but whoever doesn't stands condemned already. So what does that mean and how do we, how do we think about that? Well, just to annoy John or, or uh, Fraser, I'm going to move along here and out of camera shot, um, over to this. Now, people of tribe, I don't know if you know, but the butane gas that's in this bottle, butane and propane are the main two uh, camping gases. Um, this one is blue, so it's butane. It doesn't have a natural smell. And the gas that's piped into your house doesn't have a natural smell. It's odourless. And they add a smell to it. Now, don't panic. I'm a cub leader. Um, I'm only going to open this to a few seconds. So, no, don't smoke at the back there, Dave. Um, I'm just going to open it for a few seconds just so there's a blast of, of smell. Okay? I'll now do it back up. But some of you with a really good sense or good olfactory sense will start to, to smell that. Can anybody smell it? I can. My hand stinks now. So there's, a, there's a, a smell that's added to gas. So what does, what does that mean? So here's the illustration. Imagine this room was filling up with poisonous gas. Naturally, in its natural state, it's odourless. You can't smell it. But someone, years ago, had the bright idea to add this smell to it. And one of you guys smells gas. I can smell gas. You do what all good English people do, don't you? And you ignore it for a bit. And you think, that's oh, just me. And then you, oh no, I can really smell gas. Like there's a difference between smelling gas and really smelling gas. So when you can really smell gas, you nudge someone near you, don't you? You say, I can smell gas. And they go, I can smell gas. Now you've got a choice. You've got a choice at this point when you smell gas. You can either say, ah, it'll fade, it'll pass, it'll go, or you can say, right, there's a gas leak somewhere. When I'm camping, if this stove is outside the tent and in the night, I go, I can smell gas. I don't think, ah, it'll be all right. I'll deal with that in the morning. I think, one of my kids has knocked the gas tap on and we're all going to die. So I get up and I go out and I check it and um, normally the bottle's off and the kids haven't done anything to it and it's three tenths away, they've just turned theirs on and it just wafted in. So let's think about that analogy. Let, let's think about that situation is. The other option is you could just sit here, couldn't you? And you could just let the room fill up with gas and the smell gets stronger and stronger and stronger and you just ignore it. You just blindly push it away. You just think, oh, do you know what? It's like, and you'd be fine. You'd be fine until the levels got up so high it displaced the oxygen or someone flicked a light switch on or someone turned some electrical thing on and then you'd have a huge fireball and you'd, you'd go around it. So keep that analogy in mind. Keep that idea in mind as we look at this illustration through. So does Jesus pump gas into the room to kill as many people as possible? No. The gas is in the room, it's filling up the room. We are destined to die. We are destined to be away from God. What's Jesus come into the world to do? He's come in to change that direction. He's come in to, to alter that course. He's made a way by dying on the cross for us to be restored with God in heaven. Now, head knowledge isn't enough. When you smell gas, it's an interesting exercise to say to the person next to you, do you know it's not naturally that smell? No, I didn't know that. No, they add the smell afterwards. Oh, do they really? Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. The chemical formula is, the head knowledge is useless. What will save you is smelling the gas, getting up and getting out the way. Reacting to the smell they add to gas is with what will save you. But there's a section I skipped, 15, which I'm going to link to the section set. It talks about us. 
if we're like Paul, it talks about Paul, is this a pleasing aroma to Christ? So Paul is this pleasing aroma to, to God. But we need to be very careful here because I've tied it to the next bit because Paul isn't saying, oh, I've created my, I've made a way for people to be saved. I've done something. No. What Paul is all about, what Paul is, Paul is diligently doing is he, all he does is every, ever, ever points to Jesus. And he just wants it to be about Jesus. And he doesn't do it for profit and he doesn't do it for, for other things. He does it because he's been placed in places by God. And he follows what God wants him to to do. Let's have a little bit of a look into Paul's life. In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas are so speaking effectively that great numbers of Jews and Gentiles believe um, in what they, they say. They are speaking so boldly in the area they're in, but the city becomes divided. There's two reactions to this preaching. There's those who want to believe it, and there's those that, that don't. So much so, they have to leave that area. They go to the the next area. There is a guy there who who is lame, who cannot walk. And Paul heals him. And this guy becomes jumping around and he's leaping for joy. So let's just pause there for a second. What are Paul and Barnabas having? They've got some great preaching going on. Loads of people coming to, to save. So much so that people are like, you know, oh, if they keep preaching here, everyone's going to become a Christian. And they're driven out of an area. They go to the next area. Paul heals someone. They must be like, whoa! And everybody around them thinks, God, oh, great. The gods have come amongst us. Soon as Paul and Barnabas hear that, they are torn to their core. Because they're not like, woohoo, about themselves. They want it to be about Jesus. They rush out to the crowd. They tear their clothes. And they say, we're just human. We're just humans like you. Turn from the worthless things. Turn to the living God who has made the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them. So what does that mean for us? If, if Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy are all saying it's not about them, they're, they're pointing us to Jesus, what, what does that mean for us? Well, if we, want to be, if we want to be like them, then what we are is we're the guy who adds this chemical smell. We're not the smell, we're not the aroma, we're not the thing that saves anybody. We're the guy that that adds the chemical in there. So what does that mean in practice? Well, if our world is sitting in a room filling with gas, and they don't know there's the gas, we're the message. We're the ones who are able to tell them. And it's not telling them about us, not telling them about the church, not telling them about the good things they can do. It's telling them about Jesus Christ. We're to tell people the good news of Jesus. We may have to work quite hard with some people to say, look, mate, you're a failure before God and you're destined for hell. Some people, you won't have to work on that at all because they'll absolutely know it. They'll come to that realisation and they are desperate for a saviour. Harder if people don't know they need a saviour if they think something else has saved them, if they put their hope in their school, their finance, their their money, their wealth. That's where apologetics comes into talking about those guys and explaining those, those situations. But the truth is, everybody's in a room filling with gas, metaphorically. Everybody is going to die. And unless they know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, They are not going to be with God in heaven. So, what do you think about the aroma of Christ? Is that smell bringing life? Or is ultimately that smell just another sign of your going to die? Because if you smell gas and do nothing, that's really dangerous. If you hear the words of Jesus Christ, 
from Paul, from the songs we've sung, from the act of communion we're going to witness later, from what I've opened in the Bible, and you sit there and you do nothing, that's really dangerous. Many of us in this room have given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've, we've nailed our colours to that mask. We've said we are with him. We want to we live like him. We want to we be part of him. Well, my question to you is, as I, I struggled with this last word, but I, I, I wanted to put anywhere in there. But anywhere isn't the subject, is it? What Paul says in the verses here is, they are being used to spread the word of Christ everywhere. Everywhere. Let's start with anywhere, and let's go for everywhere, shall we? But honestly, guys, where's the door being led to you? And sometimes you might see an opportunity and think, there's the door, it's open over there. But that's not where God's putting you. God's putting you in the hard. God's putting you in the difficult. God's putting you in the area where you're going to be actually really quite miserable for a bit. That's the testimony of Paul. But also, sometimes, Paul goes through a door and it's amazing. 18 months in the Corinthian church to start with was a time of great blessing. Where is Christ leading you? Where is your place to add that smell, to to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ? to, To show people that there is a way by which they can be saved and his name is Jesus. Now, some of you have been Christians for longer than I've been alive. Some of you may be thinking, do you know what, I've, you know, 212 years I've walked this earth, that's enough for me. I can't can't do any more youth work because I throw my hip out every time I pick up the, the ball to play the games. I mean, you may be there, but the attitude of Paul is interesting, isn't it? He would have us thank God for what we've done in the past. Maybe you're not 200, maybe you're younger than that, in which case you haven't got an excuse to do some evangelism, have you? I mean, it'd be different. Please don't go running after the young children if that's going to cause you major health problems. But there will be something you can do for Christ. But we don't stand on our own successes. We don't lord it over ourselves. Oh, do you know what? The light party. Lee and the team were amazing. Lee and the team did this and that. We thank them for their service but we give glory to Christ for bringing those kids and giving the skills to the leaders to do it. Because it's about him. We thank him for what he's done in the past and we ask him for help for what we're doing in the future. So young people in tribe, uh, if they're young people, what does that make the rest of you? Other people, that would be politically better than old people, wouldn't it, Joe? Um, old pe- uh, other people, next time you smell gas, react. But think about that analogy, think about that metaphor of we're adding that aroma to people. We're adding that aroma into people's lives to tell them about Jesus Christ. Because action is required. In the state they're in, they're not going to be saved. They need to turn to Jesus. They need to come through what we're going to remember in communion. They need to come at the foot of the cross. And they need to say, it's all about you. And they need to accept him as their Lord and Saviour. And all we're doing is showing them him. If you're a Christian here today, Please find ways to show people Jesus. Let's speak to God in prayer. Let's pray.